Fujitsu Heat Pumps, proudly bringing you tonight's 3D. Kia ora. tonight the second in our 10-part series, 3D Investigates. This is one of New Zealand's most notorious murders, the case of Dunedin psychiatrist Colin Bauer serving 15 years for poisoning his wife. You see, some time ago, Phil Vine discovered that Annette Bauer may actually have died of natural causes. Phil first had these suspicions about this back at the time of the trial, but his inquiries concluded just a few days ago when things came to a head in a most unexpected way. It's a strange place to start investigating the murder of a Dunedin woman. Then again, it's been a very strange case. It must be terrible to think that your father actually killed your mother. I did not believe it. This was not a cold-blooded horror crime. A two-year investigation led us to this gentleman's club in Mayfair, London. Depending on what we're told in the next half hour, we could see the unravelling of yet another New Zealand murder conviction. We're examining the infamous poisoning of Annette Bauer by her psychiatrist husband, Dr Colin Bauer. The Savile Club, urban refuge for writers H.G. Wells and Robert Louis Stevenson. These days, they also accept eminent doctors. Uh, Rudy Capaldeo, I'm a consultant neurologist, fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Dr. Capaldeo, you've examined all of the material that we've given you. Have you come to a clear conclusion? Yes. So let's get straight to the point. How did Annette Bauer die? My opinion was that she had an underlying illness that wasn't recognised, and that that was the major contributor to the cause of her death. Now that's going to upset a few apple carts back home. So I have to ask you, are you certain? Absolutely. In fact, you could ask it the other way. Could it have been anything else? And I would say no. This medical opinion out of England, this single piece of evidence, has the potential to really put the cat among the legal pigeons. If Annette Bauer did die of natural causes, then obviously she wasn't murdered. So yet another New Zealand murder conviction might find itself here under the scrutiny of the Privy Council in London. To the names Lundy, Bain and Pora, we might have to add the name Colin Bauer. On the face of it, a miscarriage of justice, but we needed to look at all the evidence and frankly, there are some surprises to come. Anthea Bauer, Annette and Colin's daughter, who now lives in Pittsburgh, she never thought her father was a murderer. I didn't believe it. It's as simple as that. I, I did not believe it. You've never ever really wavered on that belief, have you? Either you or your brother. No, we never have. When we first interviewed them in Dunedin in 2001, Anthea was 16, Greg 18. We know that he didn't do it. We know what happened, or we think we know what happened. Their dad had just gone to prison for murdering their mum. You'd think he'd be the last person they'd be supporting. We saw her symptoms. We saw how sick she was. I mean, I honestly think that it was the disease that overcame her. An illness that was never identified at Colin Bauer's trial. The jury was told Annette Bauer was slowly, carefully poisoned by her husband. From the press benches, I watched as the prosecution described Colin Bauer crushing up diabetic pills and slipping them into his wife's food, drink, even tampons, forcing her into a fatal coma. The case offered plot lines of womanising, deceit, fantasy and a genetic disposition to murder. Little wonder they made a movie out of it. I'm arresting you for the murder of Annette Bauer on or about the 4th of January 2000. He was portrayed as a pretty terrible human being. But was that fair? Her father brought the family from South Africa in 96, shifting into this house in Dunedin. Annette Bauer was a physio, 
Colin Bauer, Head of Psychological Medicine at Otago University. How was their relationship um, together? Well, I mean, from my point of view, it was, it was solid. They were good together. And in, in the last year, was there any straining in that relationship, did you feel? Well, I mean, there wasn't stra I mean, obviously it was strained, but it was strained from a point of concern. I mean, it was, uh, it was concern for one person being really unwell. Her mum got sick in 1999. Dizziness, weakness, eye problems. They didn't know what it was. And at that stage, m my brother and my father and I were all trying to get her to go to a doctor so that we could so that she could get the help that she clearly needed. Why was she so resistant? My mother was a very stubborn lady. How worried was your dad on a scale of one to 10? Extremely, uh, a 10. In November, Annette got so bad she was hospitalized, twice going into a diabetic coma. It was thought she had a tumor. They operated but found nothing. She came home Christmas Eve, and yeah, within a within a couple of days, um, she was bedridden. And I mean, we were all we were all really worried. On the fifth morning of the new millennium, Colin Bauer found Annette unconscious in their bed. This is him calling one one one. Is she grieving at all? Hey, look, I'm, I'm a doctor and I'm not panicking at the moment. I can remember the red body bag. And then my dad called my friend's mother for me because my friend was out of town. So I um, called the mother and she came and we took the dog for a walk. I was definitely in shock. I mean, you don't expect that to happen when you're 15. You know, one minute she's there and the next she's not. And so, you know, the carpet's kind of ripped out from underneath your feet almost. And the carpet hadn't stopped moving. Her father was about to be charged with murder murdering her mother. Yeah, no, I would say that, you know, my mum dying and my dad being sentenced to prison are pretty, pretty up, you know, pretty equal to uh, being the worst days of your life. Nine months after her mother's unexplained death, police arrived early at the Bowers' home in Dunedin. Anthea was 15, still in pyjamas. And they just knocked on the door and started asking reams and reams of questions. I put it to you that you intentionally administered the drugs to your wife to kill her. Detectives arrested her father, Colin. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The six-week murder trial, one of the most complicated and expensive in New Zealand legal history. Also, one of the strangest I've ever sat through. Colin Bauer was accused of being a womanizer, taking two mistresses. A liar, faking prostate cancer for sympathy, shaving off his hair and forging medical reports, and a fantasist, pretending he'd been imprisoned and tortured in South Africa so he could get bail. He made mistakes. Was he a liar by character? No. Was he a fantasist? No. And in the most bizarre of twists, while Colin Bauer was in court here in Christchurch, his adopted son was being convicted in South Africa for murdering his wife. Colin Bauer Jr. will soon be back in court for the murder of his 23-year-old wife, Rhea Bauer. Crazy coincidence. Well, yeah, but coincidences happen, I suppose. Her father had written false prescriptions to accumulate diabetic pills. The effect of those drugs exactly matched the symptoms which put her mother in hospital. And those were the exact tablets found in Annette's dead body. The accused administered what was in effect a cocktail of drugs to Annette Bauer with the deliberate intention of causing her death. The jury took just three and a half hours to reach their verdict. 
Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? We find him guilty. Yes, Dr. Barr, having been found guilty of the offence of murder, you're sentenced to life imprisonment. You may stand up. I was not very happy with the whole situation. Professor Marks, defence witness at the trial, a world expert on diabetic drugs. He thought the pills alone weren't enough to have killed her. It's impossible to rule it out completely, but I didn't think that they were the immediate cause of her death. And that gave you some cause for concern at the Absolutely. time? Absolutely. Another cause for concern, the type of pills that were found at autopsy. One of them, metformin. Metformin, big tablets, uh, foul taste. So foul, he says, there's no way Annette could have taken them without knowing. To get those tablets into her, by any other means than swallowing them, would have been impossible. Why would she have willingly swallowed them? Anthea believes her mum might have been trying to commit suicide. It comes back to her state of mind that she was in at the time when she was clearly feeling truly terrible. Anthea suspects her mother took her own life because she was so sick, but we couldn't explain what underlying disease my mother had. So, I mean, that was a problem. By blind chance, that explanation would come 15 years later from the other side of the world. We're traveling south from London to Cobham in Surrey to meet a man who got in touch with us two years ago. Investment analyst, Peter Filmer. Come on in, Phil. Welcome to New Zealand's most expensive murder trial. How did he get involved in this murder mystery? Well, that's a crazy coincidence in itself. Peter was looking for a house in Guildford. This whole thing is more than a million to one chance. He bought this place from Professor Vincent Marks. Remember him, the world expert on diabetic drugs. We became good friends. He gave Peter a book he'd just written on murder trials with a chapter on the Bauer case. One word caught Peter's eye, a tiny tumour found at autopsy called a thymoma. If there was a thymoma involved, there was a 50% probability that this patient had underlying disease. Your underlying disease? My underlying disease. Yes, because Peter suffers from a rare neurological illness called myasthenia gravis. It kills three in five patients. It's an autoimmune disease. It's one of those diseases where the body, for some reason unknown to scientists, just attacks itself. Peter wondered, could Annette Bauer have had the same thing? He read about her heart damage, her liver deformities, all recognisable symptoms of his disease, but much, much worse. Here was a patient that was actually dying of myasthenia gravis. He scoured Annette's medical notes and all the paperwork from the trial, finding even more symptoms. Annette was having problems reading, she was having double vision, she was having blurred vision, and at times her legs would fall away from underneath her. Peter went on the road, consulting specialists. He kept finding more signposts, symptoms like muscle weakness. She'd fallen down the stairs, it was evidence she had a minor car crash. She was a really good driver, so that was definitely out of character. Fatigability. She would be fine when we woke up in the morning and went to school, but then when we got home from school and sort of, you know, later on in the afternoon, uh, she would get really tired and she would go and lie down. Paralysis. She needed help walk walking. She needed help to get to the bathroom. She was evidence as having hooded eyes. She couldn't keep her shoulders up. She, in order to get to the toilet, the children had to carry her. And she was just lying there, paralysed, with this terrible feeling of impending doom. It all pointed to myasthenia gravis. All of a sudden, it slotted in with everything that we could remember. It made sense. Like a giant jigsaw puzzle that all fits together.
Dr Rudy Capaldeo, leading British neurologist. We asked him to re-examine all the information about Annette Bauer's illness. The presence of this disabling condition over four to five months getting worse and worse because it wasn't diagnosed, it wasn't treated, and then at death a thymoma was found as well, in my mind it makes the diagnosis of Icena gravis 100%. Not only did Annette's doctors miss the myasthenia, Rudy says, unwittingly, after surgery, they sent her home with two doses of penicillin. That again could have blown up into a myasthenic crisis. In other words, profound weakness, respiratory weakness and death. So the penicillin... Yes. ..could have poisoned her? Yeah, absolutely. Rudy Capaldeo has formalised his findings in this legal report, which was to form the basis of an appeal to the Privy Council. But Dr Capaldeo's report didn't explain everything. Just to be clear, your diagnosis of my senior gravis doesn't necessarily rule out the idea that Colin Bowler might have been trying to do away with his wife. It doesn't rule that possibility out at all. And a vital question remains unanswered. What were the diabetic pills doing in Annette's body, even if they didn't kill her? What did this man intend to do along this extraordinary path? What were his intentions? Only one person knows for sure, but he's in prison. As a journalist, I'm forbidden from seeing him. We convinced Peter Filmer to come to New Zealand, a Herculean effort given his paralysing illness. Before the jail visit, Peter sits down with Colin Bauer's barrister, David Moore, to discuss tactics. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be hard on him. He has to explain, why did he not tell us that? Off through a freezing Christchurch day to Rolleston Prison. They're in there for two hours and they couldn't believe what they came away with, a series of confessions. It's a very tragic story. First of all, Colin Bauer admits to giving Annette small amounts of diabetic drugs without her knowledge to get her into hospital. It was his perception that she needed medical care. So he kept on yes. giving her sulfonylurea drugs. Yes, to lower her blood sugar. To keep her in hospital to get attention. Yes, to get medical attention. That's nuts. That's why I say this is a case of misdiagnosis. The second revelation, Dr Bauer claims he and Annette agreed to help each other die if things got really bad. And her choice of death was to go into a hyperglycemic coma. So she asked him to kill her. Yes, yes, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. For 15 years, Colin Bowers denied having anything to do with his wife's death until today. How did he say he helped her die? He got a mixture of the various drugs and put them in hot water and they dissolved over a period of time and this was one of Annette's choices that he and the children got out of the house and he says he left this uh, concoction with a cordial in it with her, it was foul tasting and she sipped it over a period of time and he returned to the home sometime later with a vial of insulin and he injected her with most of the insulin. So he's now confessed to giving his wife a fatal dose of medicine? Yes. How was he when he made that confession? He did have a tear in his eye. Did you absolutely believe him when he said that Annette asked him to kill her? There are two options. The first option is that you would approach it forensically and say, here was a clinician looking at a near-death type scene and he made the choice without a net, he made the choice without a net to mercifully kill her. That would be one option. The other option is that he has said that they did a deal. 
So Peter Filmer will return home not having freed an innocent man as he once thought. In his mind, there's two possibilities, a mercy killing or assisted suicide. But of course, there's a third, murder, which Colin Bauer still denies. What do you believe? You take your pick. I, I want to know whether you believe him or not. Ah, oh, I think that in the state that the experts say Annette was in, it is a plausible story. It's very plausible and understandable you because the it? kids, the kids, no, yes, Peter, Peter, yes, Peter, answer I believe the question. It. Yes, I believe it's completely possible. So now we know more about the death of Annette Bauer than the jury ever did. There were so many competing forces vying for her life. Undiagnosed myasthenia was trying to kill her, compounded by the penicillin, and finally her own husband, for whatever reason, served her up a potentially fatal dose of drugs. Extraordinary. What can you believe from that guy? Eh? Even uh, Colin Bauer's lawyer, he's trying to work out what he's going to do now with this new confession. Yeah, I mean, assisted suicide would have landed his client 10 to 14 years in prison, but Colin Bauer's already served, he's almost served 15 years. Yeah, and he's due uh, before the parole board in September, and if the case isn't reopened, he's likely to be deported back to South Africa. OK, if you have any unanswered questions about the case, you can head to Facebook right now. Uh, Phil Vine, he's sitting there and waiting, ready to respond. And Phil's story tonight was the second in our series of 10 3D Investigates this year, funded by New Zealand On Air. 3D itself is back next Sunday at 6.30pm. We've enjoyed your company. Thanks for watching. Good night. The intelligent choice for you and your home. Fujitsu Heat Pumps. Proud to have brought you tonight's 3D.